Hello everyone and welcome to our next lecture on um, myth from for our course uh, 7007 Art and Politics of Narrative. Um, so today for our schedule we'll be picking up on uh, what we talked about last week with regards to the unconscious and the different types of forms of narrative interpretation and the ways that narrative interpretation become significant in a sort of social way. So uh, last week we talked about the way narrative interpretation can signify something about the individual, uh, you know, what the individual is going through or what they've experienced. This week we're going to talk more about how, how is it that the way that you can interpret a narrative will say something about a social system or a social situation or a cultural context. Um, so before we get into that, uh, let's do a little bit of admin. So first off, um, so we just got the news that uh, next week, even though the undergraduates will be skipping their classes for the next two weeks, we will still be doing online online classes from February for February 18th, February 25th, and onwards. So that means uh, that we're going to continue doing our lectures this way as a sort of video lecture. Um, and I'll just uh, keep posting it on Moodle. And then what I would like is for there to be uh, for you to continue doing discussion and questions in the forums. So actually, last week, I thought there were some pretty interesting questions. Uh, one about the uh, similarity between uh, Juno Diaz's experience and Junior um, in the in the book, sorry, in the short story, uh, The Cheater's Guide to Love. Um, uh, those of you who maybe uh, want to read or have read more Juno Diaz find that uh, Junior is actually a narrator in quite a bit of his uh, stories. So um, there is some sort of uh, way of thinking them together. Okay. Um, at the same time, uh, there was another uh, interesting question or comment about this idea of defining truth, you know, or what is living and lie. And I think that there was a really good point about linking this idea of, you know, is it just your perspective or is there a sort of universal truth? And uh, talking about it with regards to uh, Plato's allegory of the cave. Now, I'm not, um, I, there's no kind of set answer for this. And anyone who claims that there is a sort of truth, uh, I would, uh, you know, that there is some sort of absolute, you know, there's going to be detractors and there's going to be skepticism. And um, skepticism is also a sort of route to knowledge. So that's just the kind of point is that, you know, if you take it for granted that there is a truth, then you might stop looking for it. And if you retain a healthy level of skepticism and acknowledge the limitations of perspective, then that um, will enable you to maybe find out more, or always find out more. Um, so when it comes to the elephant, for example, like, you know, yes, you could say that there, there is a truth, that there is such thing as an elephant. Um, however, uh, even though we as a human may be able to see, you know, uh, the kind of, you know, all of the elephant per se, um, if, if, if I was trying to say something about the elephant from an elephant's perspective, the elephant, you know, another elephant might say, no, you have no idea what an elephant is. Your truth of what it is an elephant is entirely limited. You know, like we don't communicate the way that elephants do. We don't smell their, you know, glands. We don't uh, understand their kind of emotive capabilities. We don't hear them the way that other elephants hear them. So even though, yes, we have a concept for elephant, that concept for elephant from an elephant's perspective may be as limited as, uh, you know, another person who looks at the elephant's tusks and says that it's just a spear. Our definition or concept for elephant may be just as limited. So that's just something to keep in mind. Okay. And although this may seem like a sort of very abstract kind of, um, you know, maybe uh, inconsequential kind of discussion about what is true or not true, it becomes very, very important as we go along in this course. And you'll see when it comes to think, talking about things like what does it mean to represent other people? To say, for example, you know, like, um, I have the entire truth of what it means to be a woman or what it means to be indigenous or, uh, you know, to be queer. So, you know, um, having a sort of healthy level of about the limitations of our, and I'm going to use a word here, epistem, you know, our, our epistemological limitations, okay, is actually quite helpful for acknowledging that there could be some sorts of limitations, okay? So I'm going to write that down. Epistemolo epistemology, 
Okay, epistemology me is this is epistemology is the study of knowledge. Okay, a sort of theory of knowledge itself. Okay, and so a lot of these arguments about truth, you know, whether or not there is such a such thing as an overall truth or an overarching truth. You know, and also it's links to arguments about overarching things like, you know, whether or not there is a God, right? And that's why it's linked to Nietzsche, okay? You know, this study of the critique of epistemology, the criticism that there is a knowable truth is an ongoing argument, okay, in philosophy. And it's not going to be solved anytime soon, I, I can assure you of that. Um, so, um, but the idea is just that by looking at the, by acknowledging that there are sorts of limitations to what we can know, or that there are, or that there are sort of um, blind spots, or that we're limited by perspective. It kind of makes more room for more types of knowledge, more you know, more ways of thinking. And as we go on in the semester, we're going to talk about this kind of distinction between a sort of master narrative versus a sort of counter narrative, or a minor narrative, or a minor history, right? And so when you have a master narrative, you know, which um, we're going to talk more about later on in the semester, but the idea is that there's some overarching claim or some sort of master story that explains everything about a society you know you could think of it as like you know like mainstream you know kind of like a uh, history for example what's written in a textbook might be considered a sort of master narrative about the story of a nation and its people for example and that goes along with what we're going to talk about today about a structural study of a narrative and it's it's linked to society but at the same time there can be limitations to this um, and if we, if we don't acknowledge those limitations, then we remove space. We eliminate the space for other perspectives and other rooms. Okay. So I'm not saying that there is no truth. Okay? What I'm saying is that truth is limited by perspective and the possibility for an overarching, you know, um, you know, overall perspective is something that if you assume you have it already eliminates the possibility of other perspectives coming in. So it's not so much that you can never know it all, it's that you can always know more. And when you claim to know all of it, then that eliminates the possibility of more information and more knowledge and more perspectives coming in. So I think that that's also part of what Plato is trying to say, you know, um, and, you know, okay, I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not a philologist. <laughs> so I, I, you know, there's going to be a lot of arguments about that, but at the, at the, at the very least, I would say that the type of critique that we're going to be discussing of structuralism later on in the semester is that it's not so much that it's inaccurate, it's that it's always limited and that there, and that we need to acknowledge those limitations in order to find room for other perspectives that can uh, add more to our information. So by assuming that you're always in the cave, you always give yourself more space for more information and more knowledge to come in and more to, more to know. Okay. All right. Um, so yeah, so th I thought that was a healthy discussion. Um, and what I would like to do next for after this, this week's discussion, sorry, this week's lecture is to post, uh, uh, I'm going to post another forum, but what I'd like is for more of you to participate. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start recording who's participating and kind of make that part of your participation grade. I know that that's kind of annoying, but we don't really have a choice right now because I can't really participate with you in class. And another thing is we do have these um, presentations that we were supposed to do, but we can't really do them now, um, at least in class. So what I want to do is I want to develop our sort of skill set in working in the forums. And let's see how that develops. Um, and then next week, I'm going to make a kind of hard decision about what we're going to do with regards to um, the, pro the, the presentations. Um, one possibility is that you do your presentations um, online the way that I'm recording it right now or that maybe we do it through Zoom where we do a big kind of conference participation and everyone kind of logs in at the same time and we listen to each other talk, each, listen to everyone speak you know, on their particular presentations. I'm going to give you some options for that so I'll post some more explanation of that later. Okay? Alright. Cool. So let's see. Um, I, I'm just putting this because I think it's kind of important because the I think there can be some confusion about this. So I want to make sure you understand that there's a distinction between narrative and narration. Okay, so narrative is like the story, like what happens in the plot. Okay, so the narrative is the story, but narration is how the story is told. Okay, and so what we're what we're really analyzing 
Um, yes, we analyze the content of the narrative itself, like what happens in the story. But as I'm trying to show you that, you know, these stories are kind of alive. Um, and even though everyone can sort of agree that what happens in the story is the same, their interpretation of that story, you know, their and I would say interpretation itself is a new form, a, a kind of a different type of narration. Okay, many might be, some people might disagree with that. Okay, but I think that when you interpret a story, you're also re-narrating it in some way. Okay, but what's important to understand is when you're analyzing the narrative versus analyzing the narration. Okay, when you analyze the narrative, you're saying this happens, this happens, this happens. You know, this could mean this, this can mean that. Um, when you're analyzing the narration, you're saying this is how the story is told. Okay, so when it comes to your critical scholarship or your, your coursework for this and also to art and politics, you need to pay attention to both. Um, but at the same time, your focus when it comes to the critical writing that you do could be on narration in particular versus, you know, the narrative. Okay, so just having this in your tool set so that you can understand the difference between narrative and narration uh, will be useful for you when you're doing your academic work. Okay. Um, if there's any more questions about this difference between narrative and narration, feel free to ask about it in the forums, okay? All right, so let's, uh, that's it. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about structuralism, okay? Um, and then we'll talk about the monomyth as an example of a sort of structuralist interpretation of myth, okay? And what might be considered to be universal myths, okay? So, and uh, this idea of a universal um, is important to understand this idea of structure, okay? Um, now, I wanna say that I'm giving you a pretty simplified version of understanding how structuralism is used, um, but uh, I think that's okay. If you wanna read up more about it, there's readings um, that are available, and of course, you can take entire courses on it. And if, you, if, if, you, if you're more interested in this, you know, post in the forums, I'll provide more resources for you to talk about it, okay? But it is, there is a sort of basic critique of structuralism, you know, that uh, we often use in the humanities, especially in, you know, like literature, comparative literature or cultural studies. Um, so that's kind of a, a very important, <laughs> how to put it this, like a theoretical story, like a storyline of critical theory, you know, the kind of move towards structuralism and then the move away from it or like post-structuralism. Okay, so this week then, uh, this these next two weeks, sorry, maybe next three, four weeks really, what I've been doing is setting you up for thinking about structuralism and how it kind of works, and then also kind of being able to attend to the critiques, okay? All right, so um, I think we can, we can go back to this, uh, I can go back to using this elephant example, you know, for thinking about structuralism, okay? So let's say then that, uh, sorry, typing the wrong thing, elephant, Lineman. Okay, so let's go back to this image since it seems to kind of really resonate really well for many of you. So let, let's let's use this analogy again. Okay, all right. So let's look at this picture. Apparently, it's a Sufi story. I had no idea. Okay, all right. So now let's imagine that you know there is an elephant. Okay, and we assume that this elephant exists. Okay, and yet every single individual who looks at this elephant is blind, so they assume that their particular part of it, you know, uh, is actually what's true about the elephant, right? Like an elephant is a big snake only because I can feel its trunk, <laughs> okay? Elephant is a tree stump, elephant is a spear, right? So a structuralist view would be saying that actually if you look at the relationship between all of these perspectives, you will be able to see them as sort of expressions or symptoms or indicators of a larger overall structure that determines all of these individual things. So for example, right, it's not that structuralism would argue that it's not that all of these people are wrong. It's that all of these people are only seeing their particular point about that overall thing, okay, which we would consider to be an elephant. So the idea then is that if there is a sort of overall thing like a big elephant and then there's lots of things that you can see about that thing, then if you think about all these things in conjunction and the relationship to each other, right? So if instead of saying, oh, it's a tree stump, it's a snake, if someone can collect these things together and look at it as a whole and say, okay, well, it's a, it's not only is it a snake, it's also a stump, it's also a piece, a sheath of leather, it's also a wall, it's also a furry mouse, it's also a tail. 
If I think about all these things in relationship to each other, they point out to an overall structure of something bigger than all of them that is linked and related to each other. Okay, so that, from that analogy, you could you could sort of construct or see a sort of structure of an elephant overall that creates or generates our understandings of it through these kind of different perspectives. Okay, so the idea is that if you think about these different perspectives or these kind of different viewpoints on the elephant in relation to each other, you will be able to construct or imagine a larger overall thing, which is the elephant that has all of these things in uh, that creates or generates the possibility for seeing or noticing or understanding or knowing these little things, okay? That there's an overall structure to it, okay? So now in, what if instead of we think, instead of thinking about an elephant, what about, what if we thought about something like society, okay? Something, a really big overall structure, right? Like uh, capitalism or capitalism in a specific time period, okay? What if there is some universal structure? And by understanding the sort of, you know, different aspects of that structure as expressed to us in different things, like in stories, like in myths, right? We're able to piece together all of these things in order to see that large overall structure, okay? So that is a very basic way of thinking about what structuralism is, okay? Now, the way that the first approach to structuralism actually didn't come from narrative, narratologists or, you know, literary studies, you know, it actually comes from linguistics, Okay, so lingu linguists, uh, all uh, specifically Saussure, Ferdinand Saussure, who's you know a real linguistic genius, right, talks about how is it that you, he creates this field of semiotics. Okay, so Saussure was born in Switzerland. Uh, he was trained in linguistics, and he didn't write any essays or books. All he really did was take really detailed notes. Oh, sorry. All he did was kind of like come up with these ideas, and he taught them. But then his, uh, and he did this course in general linguistics, okay? And it, it is interesting to think about the importance of linguistics, right? Because Saussure, even though I, I don't know exactly who Saussure read, okay? But you can see that there's a very strong influence of, of, of Nietzsche on, on Saussurean kind of thinking, okay? Which is that actually, um, if you think about the meaning of a word, it changes through time. So a word does not always mean the same thing especially when it comes to different languages or the way that that concept gets translated through different languages and through different time periods, okay? Now, Nietzsche had a very special ability to do this because he was a philologist. So he would look at a concept and see how it changes when it gets translated from, I don't know, ancient Greek to modern Greek or into English or to German or whatever, okay? I don't I don't know the details, okay? I'm, I, I am not a Nietzsche scholar. <laughs> but... What's important to understand is he's able to say, it's like, look, these things change, okay? And yet at the same time, as these things change, they still relate to some sort of overall structure, at least. That's what that's what Saussure would say and his kind of proponents of structuralism would argue, okay? So in order to understand language, then let's go back to linguistics. Saussure creates this field called semiotics, which is a sort of study of the Okay, this is the definition here. A science, okay, notice they call it a science, all right, and that's important, okay, because that's part of the critique that later that later um, later theorists will have, specifically like Derrida, okay, a science which studies the life of science at the heart of social life, okay. So the one he's calling a science, but he's saying that you know there is signs are living, okay, and they're at the height of social life. So he says that a linguistic structure is a system of signs that expresses ideas. So then language itself is something that does not describe the real world. There's no direct attribution of language or a word. A word, there's no direct attribution. Instead, that the meaning of that word is directly related to the social system itself. Okay. Um, so he says the sign then is a model for understanding how language, meaning, and communication are organized. Okay, so instead of thinking about words and language as representation of reality, instead you're thinking about language as a sort of expression of the way that reality has been organized in social life. Okay, so um, do we still have the elephant? Okay, so not only is not only are all these things indicated, let's say the elephant is like a language, right? Not only are these things indicative of the elephant, but they're also indicative of how these individuals relate to the elephant, 
Okay, so this person and his perspective is that the elephant is like a big snake. That's because his relationship to that larger social system is organized around that around his particular position. Okay, likewise, then words that are used are also going to be based around that kind of relationship to the overall structure. So what he's saying then, and this is this is the, the kind of basic units, okay, of um, <laughs> the basic unit of meaning for uh, Sasurian kind of linguistics is that you have a sign, and there's the signifier and the signified, okay. So he's saying that the linguistic sign does not unite a thing and a name, but a concept and a sound image, okay. So when you think about a sign, all right. So let's say it's like a like a stop sign or anything. The sign does not the sign is not directly linked to a thing. It's linked to a concept. Okay? And Okay, sorry, let me rephrase again, okay? The sign is the overall thing. Okay? It's the overall thing. Okay? It's the concept and the sound image. Okay? So uh So when you when you think of like a word, okay? A word is not just uh, the graphical representation of that word. Okay, so like if you were to say, say word, right, word would be W O R D. Okay, but W R D, like that graphical lettering, that's not just the word, that's not just the sign. It also is a relationship between though that graphical representation, W O R D, and the concept of a word. Okay, so a sign then is a concept and a sound image together. Okay, so the signifier, okay, the signifier is what you would perceive, you know, as a sound or a visual image. Okay, so let me give you, let's, here, let me, let me, let, let's create, let, I'm just going to create a new, let me insert a, okay, all right, new slide. All right, uh, not useful, sorry about this, just give me a sec. New slide. Okay, cool. All right. So let's say we have a sign. Let's let's pick something very easy to understand. Okay. Um, in the next example, I'm going to use an apple. So um, we should just use the apple. Okay, fine. Let's 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 do that. No, no, no. Let's let's do something else. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay. All right. Let's do this. Okay. So um, so this is a graphical representation of a word and that sorry of a sign okay the sign why does it say Japanese or oh, whatever okay that sign okay has two things that go along with it oh, sorry no, let's just that's good enough. okay so this the 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 sign is you know uh, we would as a concept, what is the concept, right? This, okay, so this character, right, um, is not just a graphical representation, but it's also a concept. So the concept is what we think of, you know, as like a person, human, okay, right? But the graphical and the, or the sound image Right, is the you know is um, <laughs> this is so confusing? How do you not refer it to itself, right? But is okay, and let's just say we're using pinyin, right? Is run, right? In Mandarin, at least, okay. So run is a sound image. It sounds like run, okay, and you also has this kind of image, okay. So yeah, let's just copy this, make it small, okay. Now, but overall, linked together is what makes it a sign. Okay, so a sign is not um, a sign is not just the concept. Okay, the sign is the concept and the sound image together. Okay, similarly, right? Let's say like the thing is the the sign is like elephant. Okay, so the concept. Okay, so I need some sort of representation of this overall linkage. Okay, so let's just. Uh, I'm not gonna draw an elephant, okay? Because that's also a graphical representation, right? But let's let's just say elephant sign, okay? All right. So then, what's the concept of elephant, right? It would be a large mammal 
with four, you know, four leg, large four legged mammal, you know, with trunk or whatever, right? You know, that that's the concept, okay, that you think of. You think of an elephant, right? And not all elephants are the same, right? There are there are different species of elephants. Uh, there are, you know, there are other parts of the elephant family, right? So, you know, and even ele even within elephants, there's even within this category of elephants, there's a huge diversity, right? There are young elephants, old elephants, male, female, you know, uh, teenage elephants, alpha, ele you know, there's elephants that are in a, you know, in a, anyway, okay? But then the sound image, right, would be, you know, like elephant, right? E L E P. Or, you know, like, let's say even we use the sound image that's in another language, right? So let's say it's like da shen. Okay. Oh, that's fun. There's a little, little elephant here, too. Okay. We'll use that. <laughs> Two. Okay. So let's, let's put that here. <laughs> Sign. Okay. Okay. All right. So a sign then is not just the word, right? Not just the graphical representation of the word or it's how it sounds, okay? Uh, it's not just, here, maybe we can, just to be consistent, let's see if we can get an image of a person, just to be consistent. And it's because it's fun. I don't know, no, I guess not. Okay, all right, screw it. Okay, all right. Sorry, I'm just doing this now so that when you look at the PowerPoint later, it'll be consistent or whatever. Okay. Um, okay. So here's two examples of signs. One is sign of you know like. So anyway, so the sign is the concept and the sound image together. Okay, and th they're they're linked together. Okay. All right. So the signified right is the abstract concept or idea. Okay. So. This is the signified, the large four-legged mammal with a trunk, okay? The signifier is a perceivable sound or visual image, okay? So th uh, this, da xiang, is the, si sorry, and that's Mandarin, but is the signifier of this concept. So these two are linked together, okay? And together they make the sign, okay? So when it comes to our discussions of the elephant and whether it's true or not, if you break it down in this way, you'll find that, okay, even this term elephant itself, what is the truth? The concept that there exists or that our signifier for that concept, which is dashang or elephant, okay? So um, with that in mind then, it's important to understand what the, the point that Sassur makes is there's no particular reason that the signified is linked to the signifier. This is very important, okay? So for example, right, why does the sound image apple signify the, you know, like the fruit apple, okay? Is there something about apple, A-P-P-L-E, -P -P -E, that sounds like, that makes us think of the fruit, okay? And actually what Sassur and obviously Nietzsche also came to understand is that actually these relationships are arbitrary. And what, what they mean by arbitrary is that it's not based on, you know, kind of like um, a good reason for it. Okay, so, you know, there are some arguments in, about Chinese that uh, are, are Sinitic kind of graphical writing that there is a definite reason, like, you know, like, let's say Xiang, it kind of looks like, it kind of looks like an elephant maybe, or Run actually looks like a two-legged person. But then, ultimately, though, it's still arbitrary, and there's still so, sort of no kind of good reasoning for it. A really great example of, you know, like, how the signs are arbitrary is how sign language is completely different everywhere around the world. So, like, sign language, even though we would think of sign language as, like, oh, you know, like, it should be universal, right? Uh, you know, like, the, the, the word for, or the sign language, sign, <laughs> the signifiers, you know, are, uh, and the image of the signifier, or the movement for the signifier is different, in, even in different places and in different countries and in different languages. So, for example, American sign language is very, very different from what I would consider, to, I don't know, I guess there's a Cantonese or maybe Mandarin or even Chinese sign language. I don't know. Okay. But the word, the word for person in American sign language is different from the word for per, sorry, let me rephrase that. The gesture, <laughs> okay. The gesture for person is not the same as the gesture. 
in American Sign Language is not the same as the gesture for person in, you know, uh, sign language used in another place, like, I don't know, in Indonesia or something like that. Okay, so that is to indicate that the links between the concept and the sound image in every single language is arbitrary. So instead of there being an actual reason, right, why, instead the reason why there's a relationship between signifier and signified is based on convention. So convention is a sort of general agreement. So, you know, as language gets used, and remember language is alive, right, it keeps growing, it keeps changing, there comes to a sort of general agreement that this graphical or or sound representation of this convention is what gets is what's correct okay or what's gets used um, so different languages in different contexts use different signs to indicate the same concepts all right so for example like uh, maybe those of you who have children or you know have been around young children or like babies right like my uh, our kid is kind of a uh, sort of learning to talk right now <laughs> kind of right and so it's like it's very clear that there's no definite reason why a certain concept is linked to a certain word, okay? So like right now, like our kid, he he kind of confuses like uh, daddy and mommy and auntie. So like he kind of calls me auntie and then calls my wife daddy or baba, right? So it's kind of like, and then if if we continue to respond to that, Right, and we were like, okay, yeah, I, you know, I'm auntie, and my wife responded to papa, mama. Eventually, that would become a convention, a sort of general agreement of our language in our social system, which is just us three or you know our small group. Okay, but then you know, like as language grows and it in introduces more, more, and more people, right? These kind of conventions change, they grow, they diminish, right? And so, like that's why it's that languages can be understood is because people come to a general agreement about these meanings. Right. So like even though some things might seem totally arbitrary and not make any sense. Right. So like like Singlish, where it's like it's got Malay and Mandarin and Hokkien and English all kind of mixed together because there's a general agreement by the population of people that are using it. There becomes an understanding, you know, that becomes conventionalized. OK, so what that says then. Right. Is that. Signs only mean something because of their relations and their difference from other signs, okay? So signs cannot exist in isolation. They depend upon each other for meaning. So this is really important, right? Language is arbitrary, relational, and constitutive, okay? Now, what's important about this is it's very difficult to think, <laughs> okay? It's very difficult to create, generate, or dismiss, or understand knowledge without language okay so to to have any sort of cognition okay a lot of people argue is linguistic now if the sort of basis of our you know knowledge is linguistic or language based and our language is arbitrary relational and constitutive that means that there's no sort of absolute relationship between that that knowledge is always going to be Sort of slippery or perspectival because it is based on a system that is ultimately arbitrary, relational, and constitutive. At the same time, it's still constitutive of that larger thing, which is its social or society, that social system. Okay. So with structuralism, then structuralism then kind of takes those findings in linguistics and jumps kind of further out. Okay, so it says that signs are not signs are not just language; they're practices, phenomena, and activities. They're systems of signification. Okay, so even though originally semiotics was only understood to think about language, semiotics also became a way to understand interpretation of things like metaphor in a film or a story. Right. So, like, let's say you're watching a movie, and like the movie shows like uh, you know an apple, you know, and like someone bites out of that apple, right? You know, and someone might read it as a signifier of like sin and like the fallenness of man or something. Okay, so this is an example of a semiotic reading where you're reading, you're looking at a metaphor and trying to understand what it means, right? And yet at the same time, that metaphor, you know, and what it means is linked to the social system in which it's developed. It's based on convention. And the, the relationships between these conventions that the relationships between the signifiers and the signified then indicate the value and the meaning of that that social system places on it, okay? 
So going back to our elephant example, let's say there's a large social system, right? And there's a group of people who, for them, the elephant, you know, uh, should be the the concept of the elephant uh, is related to this idea of a big snake or something, right? This relationship between these two could indicate something about that social group and this particular group of people. You know, for them, you know, elephants are, you know, s s like they they their meaning to them has a lot to do with their social situation, which might be that they're in front or something like that, okay? A much easier way to think about this is the way that signifiers can mean very different things to different people um, based upon that kind of population. So one example would be like uh, the color white, okay? So uh, the color white in a kind of a Judeo-Christian sort of convention it represents like purity, right? Or like, uh, you know, cleanliness, you know, and like heaven or something like that, okay? But then a sort of, uh, you know, like a Confucian, I think, Eastern Asian kind of context, I know this is true in like China and Vietnam and some places, is that white represents death, okay? So these kind of systems of signification are based upon the conventions of that local place. So by understanding the, what that, what, what the understanding the relationship between that concept okay and its signifier actually demonstrates or teaches you or you can learn something about that social system or that cultural group or that population that employs that convention so by studying the relationships between for example whiteness and death can teach you something about the groups that use that signifier Sorry, or use that sign, okay? So these values and meanings are indicative. So then like language, culture can be analyzed by looking at the structures of signification, okay? Signs transfer information, and we organize our understanding of the world through signs. And it's important to understand that sign systems are not natural. So therefore, we can analyze sign systems to understand the meaning and values of that community. So that's basically what structuralism is. It's like, okay, you know, if we look at these uh, signifiers and we understand, you know, the value that's attributed to it and, uh, you know, and it's linked to concepts, then we can then extrapolate from that relationship something about the value systems of that society. Okay. So, so you read signs to understand the overarching structure. So you're always moving, when it comes to structuralism, you're moving from these particularities to the sort of general, general, okay? So it's like, you know, one, one example of a structuralist kind of reading would be like, okay, so, you know, I want to look, look for the patriarchal structure, you know, of uh, our present society by looking at particular representations of, you know, um, uh, like misogynistic representations of, you know, uh, women and children in its media, so that's a structuralist reading. I'm saying that, you know, by looking at these different images and how they value women, it says something about how the kind of, and what these signifiers represent. It tells you something about how the overall social system values women, okay? So you're always kind of relating the text then to a larger containing structure. So you're looking at conventions like genre, intertextual connections, you know, underlying universal narrative structure or reoccurring patterns, okay? And this often gets linked to other kind of isms, you know, like, um, mm, right, like capitalism or socialism or something like that. So if capitalism is the overall structure, then if we analyze cinema, right, and we look for signifiers and understand the relationships between the signifiers and the signified, we'll be able to see the influence of that overall structure. Right? And through that, we can then sort of piece together to understand or see it as evidence of that overall structure, of that social system. Okay? So a very important example of structural analysis, then, that we're, that we're talking about in today's lecture is this, the structural study of myth. Okay? So let's say, then, you, have a, you create this kind of system. You're saying, okay, I can understand the, the way that a certain population or a cultural group value certain things based upon the stories that they tell and the ways that they signify the meaning of certain concepts. Okay, so uh, Cloud Levi-Strauss was like 
one of the first to do this kind of structural study of myth, but one of the most famous examples is Joseph Campbell's The Hero with a Thousand Faces, where he talks about something called the monomyth. So uh, the monomyth is quite famous because um, there's a kind of story about how um, George Lucas was uh, reading about the monomyth, and that's how he kind of came up with the idea for Star Wars. So he wrote the first uh, Star Wars story based upon the monomyth, okay, or what's called the hero's journey. And you'll find that a lot of these kind of origin stories of like superheroes and comic books really take up the monomyth kind of structure to build it, right? So let's let's zoom in a little here, okay, just so you can read it a bit better. Okay, so the monomyth story is starts with one is there's like an ordinary world, right? So with the example of Star Wars, right, it's like Luke lives on this planet, this desert planet, and he's kind of bored and it's kind of ordinary. He doesn't know that there's this big thing that's going on outside of the galaxy, which is, you know, that there's um, intergalactic war, okay? And then there's a call to adventure, right? There's an increased awareness. So in Star Wars, Luke Skywalker, and this is the, the first one, A New Hope, okay, the first one that was released, okay? So in that, there's a call to adventure, right? So it's like there is... Um, he finds this droid and the droid has like this kind of accidental like help me Obi-Wan you're my only hope or whatever and he's like oh I gotta who's Obi-Wan Kenobi oh is that Ben Kenobi you know maybe I need to go get this so there's this call to adventure right and it's like okay well let me try to get this droid back to this guy so it's like normal life just small thing right and then there's a refusal of the call right so he so he goes there and then Ben Kenobi's like hey you know, you should join me and, you know, fight this intergalactic war. And Luke's like, no, nah, I can't do that. I got to go back to my uh, moisture farm or hydration farm or whatever in order to, you know, um, what's it called? Uh, you know, help my aunt, Uncle Owen and my aunt, I forgot to understand it or whatever. Okay, clearly I've watched Star Wars way too many times. Okay, so he relu he's, he's reluctant to change, right? But then he kind of like continues meeting with the mentor, okay? So there's always some sort of mentor he encourages you. And in this case, it's Obi-Wan Kenobi, right? The kind of wise old man, okay? And he overcomes that reluctance and he crosses the threshold. So when you cross the threshold, this is when you leave the ordinary world and join the special world, the world of the rebellion, the world of the resistance, right? So he crosses that threshold and he's willing and committed to change, right? And he starts on his adventure into that special world. Um, so once you cross that threshold, there's no going back, right? So he goes back to the farm and finds that Uncle Owen and stuff have been killed. And there's no going back. He's been sucked into this intergalactic war. And he's committed to change, right? So he goes through tests, allies, and he makes enemies, right? You're experimenting with change where he first learns about the force, okay? And this is important, right? Um, so he's approaching this kind of preparing for these big changes, right? To use the force, to find it, attempt this kind of big change. And as a reward, right, you know, finally he gets to seize the sword. And in this case, it's like grabbing the lightsaber and finally being able to use it. So he, the consequences of the, the, of the attempt, he improves, right? And there's the right? And then there's the road back, right? You know, so you have these kind of attempts at, you know, you, you go through this kind of special world and then you have these bad things that happen, right? Like Obi-Wan dies, you know, and it's like he's got to go back to the real world with his kind of newfound learning and his newfound skill set and see if he can influence the world. So ultimately he finds mastery, right, you know, of the problem by using the force to destroy the Death Star, okay? So it's like you have to go through this journey, learn this special skill, which will then help you rescue your community or save your community, and ultimately solve the problem. And so for Joseph Campbell, he calls it the hero with a thousand faces, is because this hero as a sort of archetype is the same, okay? He would argue that it's the same all over. All over in every myth, there's always this hero's journey. And so there's a hero, but the hero is the same, it just has a thousand faces, okay? So that's a very kind of like, um, uh, what would be called like a Jungian ar archetype, okay? Jung was a sort of uh, a pre uh, poet, protege and eventually he moved on from Freud but he said it's like yeah you have these kind of archetypes right like Oedipus could be an archetype you know and there are other archetypes right and for Joseph Campbell then he thinks that this is the kind of main one the monomyth okay all right so that's just an example of a structural analysis of a story you're taking up all these parts and seeing how all these parts represent a certain community and it's kind of way of thinking about you know like the value system right so then this is a community then whose values something like called the force, which is like an intuitive kind of understanding of, <laughs> I don't know, your relationship to the world or something like that. Okay. 
and it uses this kind of story to emphasize the importance of that. All right. So uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. The thing, the thing I want you to understand, though, is that it's, it's not that important to, to see that, oh, you know, the, the monomyth is everywhere. You know, part of why the monomyth might be everywhere is because it has been conventionalized in our capitalist system. And it sort of is a storyline that makes a lot of money. <laughs> so it gets used quite often in kind of big budget movie making. So I'm saying it's, it's just like just like every single kind of story depends upon the perspective. Even believing that the monomyth is everywhere is in itself a sort of convention, you know, with a particular perspective on it. Okay, obviously one that's very very male oriented and very kind of individualistic. Okay, you know, the story of a, a, a community salvation might not always be based upon an individual. Right. So anyway, let's move on. So this idea that you can use these kind of linguistic structures and extrapolate that to a social system was really championed by Claude Levi-Strauss, who was an anthropologist. Um, so yeah, he was an anthropologist and ethnologist, okay? And he developed this theory of structural anthropology. So anthropology is the study of people, okay? So he was, the, he, he was one of those first who would go to these kind of like uh, colonies throughout South America and kind of leave the kind of major cities and go into the kind of like... Um, go into indigenous areas and try to understand these kind of tribes and their groups, right? So um, he's a founding figure in social sciences and he was the object of Derrida's critique where he, of, you know, where he deconstruct, of deconstruction, okay? Um, but we'll talk more about that. Uh, we can talk more about that if you'd like. I, it's not really important to our understanding of narrative, but, you know, Levi-Strauss was always kind of um, upset that Derridians were so kind of der derisive of his work when he himself, you know, and agreeing with Saussure that, yes, these conventions are arbitrary. And so that arbitrariness is something that can be analyzed as well, right? Um, the only difference that I would say Levi-Strauss, or the kind of major difference that Derrida has with Levi-Strauss is that Levi-Strauss thinks that this study of structure is a science, Okay, and when you use this term science, it means that there's something absolute about it. There, it does make a, in of itself, makes a truth claim, okay, about the facticity of this structure. Whereas Derrida says, no, language is play, okay? So even if, even if, you know, like, and so if you were going to study as a science, that kind of makes it kind of rigid, you know, as if this is always going to be true. And this is the kind of approach that Levi-Strauss took when he does his structural study of myth. He says that when you look at a myth, if you look about the way that the myth treats a certain type of figure, right? Like someone who commits incest and hero. Okay. And I'm making this up here. Okay. But saying that if the myth kind of idolizes or castigates the people who are committing incest, then that indicates something about the way that this population values the problem or the issue of incest. Okay. So there's a kind of structure that indicates an absolute connection between the two. Whereas Derrida, you know, and other post-structuralists are willing to say, actually, you know, you can't even make that claim about that population because this link in of itself is already too universal, you know, like, especially because there's a lot of play involved in storytelling. Okay. And the reasons why, you know, incest might be valued or disvalued in that particular situation could be very, very particular to that situation. So this kind of tendency to universalize that structure can be misplaced. Okay. Um, so it's too generalized. It's too universal. It's not particular enough. And to call it a science is sort of a misnomer. Okay. So some very famous works by Levi-Strauss are Is Tristes Tropiques. Uh, which is a sort of um, non-fiction kind of uh, memoir about his uh, about his uh, journeys and studies. Okay, he wrote Structural Anthropology, which is kind of like his um, uh, kind of methodology book, I guess. He wrote The Savage Mind, and he wrote a book called The Raw and the Cooked. So I really like using this example of the raw and the cooked because it really kind of demonstrates the relationships of science, right? So. And the way that binary oppositions are used to explain things, right? So how do you know that something is raw? What, what makes a food raw? Food is raw because it hasn't been cooked, right? But then what is cooked food? Cooked food is cooked because it's not raw. And yet at the same time, if it weren't for cooking, you would not have this concept of raw food. It's just food, right? So like a dog, when you give the dog food, it doesn't think, oh, this food is cooked or it's raw. 
right? It just, it just, it's just food, right? Or, and even if, if a dog even has a concept of food, okay? So a lot of the concepts that we have are built upon their relationships to other concepts, okay? So Derridian deconstruction then is looking at these kind of binaries and taking them apart and explaining how these constructions indicate something about a social system, but at the same time that there's a lot of play involved in this construction. Whereas Levi-Strauss would say that, oh, this, by analyzing this construction, you're doing a scientific analysis of the value system intrinsic to this population. So this disagreement then is a disagreement not of type, not of kind, okay, but it's a disagreement of degree, of degree of the seriousness applic and applicability of this methodology, okay? And, you know, a lot of this is also linked to Nietzsche, okay? All right, so uh, let's, let's, let's move on. So, so here's an example of Levi Strauss's, you know, structural study of the of the Oedipus myth, right? So it's like each one indicates a different type of sort of uh, situation or eva evaluation. Okay, so in the myth of Oedipus, right, there's um, you know, different signifiers. Okay, so one is uh, let's oh, signs. Okay, let's call it signs. Okay, so one is Oedipus marries his mother Jocasta. Okay. And then Antigone buries her brother Polynices in defiance of the law. Okay, so both of these then are indications that blood ties are overrated. Okay, it's not so important that you have blood ties. Where whereas other signs, right, Oedipus killing his father, right, and Eteocles kills his brother Polynices, are indications that blood ties are underrated. Okay, so this is the value: blood ties are underrated, blood ties are overrated. Okay, and they're also part of a sort of a larger over, overall structure that indicates something about how that population feels about human origins. Okay, I'm not quite sure what he means by contraries here. Okay, but that's that's not that important. Okay, so there are other signs, right? And these other signs might point to something. A toxinous. Okay, and this is a very complicated thing, but it's about the kind of genesis of humanity, whether humans come out of the earth like one to one, or whether humans come out of a relationship of like two, like a mother and father coming together to create a one, okay? So that's not that important, especially because we're not anthropologists, okay? But if you are studying society, right, you know, looking at these signs and saying that it indicates something about our overall structure or the way that this, this society values something is structural study, okay? Whereas, you know, by looking at it in a sort of post-structural way, you're saying, oh, there's a lot more things going on than just the population structure, you know? Um, for example, like I would say, it's like, you know, like the, 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 the importance of convention, you know, and how these conventions get, you know, uh, solidified, not because of the value system of that group, but because of the ways that, you know, that group, you know, is used to receiving certain kinds of stories or something like that. So this kind of habituation can happen through other things like, in, you know, uh, industry like uh, industrial kind of conventions or medium conventions or, you know, the technology itself, okay? So it's like, it's not just about, like, it, the value system for these conventions might have something else going on, not just the value systems of that population. So the structure cannot be overdetermined, okay? So here are some sort of uh, ex excerpts from Tristis Tropiques, which is actually, if you look at it, a piece of literature, it's really quite beautiful. I recommend that you read it. But I'm not going to kind of go through this. But he's basically explaining how a sunset, you know, and different images of the sunset can be pieced together in order to understand the overall structure of the process of a sun going down. And so even though these things kind of change through time, right, the image of the sun, it indicates a larger structure, an overall process of the sun setting. Okay, so I recommend that you read that. It's quite beautiful. Okay, he has another sort of section too that talks about um, the way that uh, he works with this kind of indigenous tribe member who's like a chief of his people, but he's kind of losing that kind of political power. So the chief then acts like he can understand how to write uh, with the kind of uh, foreigners because that would give him some sort of political capital to be able to make bargains and make agreements, right? And so this is a sort of indicator of the arbitrariness of language and religion. Okay, so that's another kind of uh, interesting piece of writing from Tristestro Peaks. So those are both in the Moodle resources, so you can look them up. Okay, all right, so we are 55 minutes in, so I don't want to go too long. All right, so let's let's talk a little bit about ceremony and Leslie Marmon Silco and its relationship to the monomyth. 
All right, so you should have read you should have read the first half of ceremony already. Okay, um, so I'm uh, I'm going to talk more about it next week. Okay, and I hope that you guys can all of you um, you all okay can discuss it in the kind of discussion forums a bit more. But um, uh, I'll just do a short introduction to it right now. So Leslie Marmon Silko is a poet and a writer. Um, she a ceremony, and she wrote ceremony. Ceremony is kind of like the. I mean, like, it might seem kind of cool that we're studying like indigenous writing in in um, in this class on art, art and politics of narrative. But at the same time, it's like the most well known piece of indigenous writing. It's like the canon. So we're, we're not making this kind of huge kind of revolutionary move by teaching it. But um, the reason I chose ceremony is not for its kind of radical departure from the canon, which it isn't, okay? But because it, I don't know, I, it's, it's definitely my favorite, well, okay, my favorite changes through time, right? But right, I don't know about right now, but definitely in college and university when I first read it, ceremony was like my favorite novel by far. It, it's just like, I, I just found it so moving and so well written and kind of just really something that I could really identify with. But now, you know, when I'm older, it's like, well, you know, that's a very kind of buildings roman, kind of college age, kind of, you know, uh, a, you know, form of identification with the novel and its protagonist. Okay. Anyway, let's talk about Leslie Mormon Soko. So she's of mixed ancestry. Um, she's part of the L Laguna Pueblo tribe, but also uh, Mexican American and Anglo American. So the Laguna Pueblo is uh, from the kind of uh, North American Southwest. So um, these are tribes that live in sort of desert areas. Um, so you can see a lot of that landscape in her work, you know, like these images of the Pueblo, images of like, you know, like um, dryness in the desert, you know, and that type of living, okay? Um, so she won the MacArthur kind of genius grant, and her famous novels are not just Ceremony, but Almanac of the Dead and Gardens of the Dunes, and Gardens in the Dunes, and she has some poetry and short story collections too. Okay, so she's a sort of giant of, you know, uh, American literature. So, you know, um, and Ceremony is, uh, first of all, when you read Ceremony, I want you to understand that it's not, you, you, you can't really think of it as like indigenous writing, okay? It, it doesn't follow the kind of indigenous sort of um, traditions, all right? It really is a work of modern American literature. Okay, and I mean that not in a sort of d degrading way. What I mean to say is that, first of all, you know, it's written in English, okay? Second of all, the novel form is something that was that's introduced to the Americas, you know, like, and, you know, stories are not told in novel form, you know, in indigenous communities, right? So the genre of the novel itself, you know, is already sort of a, uh, I don't know, a Euro-American kind of concept uh, and genre and medium. At the same time, though, the story itself uses a lot of kind of storytelling traditions, you know, and you and is kind of very intertextual. So there are a lot of stories of stories about telling stories in ceremony. Okay, and that's really kind of what I also love about it is that it kind of emphasizes the importance of telling stories and the way that telling stories is are not just how storytelling is not just about the story itself, but about how stories are used to heal a community and keep a community together so you know um it's very religious it's very it's a it's very ritualistic okay um and the motifs and themes reflect the importance of remembering stories and retelling stories and how even if a story is lost you you have to rewrite it and remake it and this is very much a sort of story about, you know, indigenous survival too. And it's how it's like when everything has been lost, when you've been colonized and undergone genocide, how do you survive? And a big part of that is like if the stories are lost, you have to rewrite them. You have to retell them. You have to create your own ceremony. Okay. Um, so when it comes to the narration of ceremony, the novel, I think it really reflects this kind of impetus to look for the new, to remake the old in the new. Okay, um, as a form of referentiality, but also as a way of re kind of finding a sort of social and uh, political kind of meaning. Okay, so there's a lot of special things within the narration that make it a difficult read. Okay, so I don't want, I ask that you don't give up. Okay, um, the motifs and themes, uh, you know, you can analyze it by thinking about its motifs and themes, the shifting temporality. There's a lot of what people might call modernist elements, but then it's very, very indigenized. Okay, um, and uh, so you know, there, there's a lot of ways to look at it. 
you know, if we're thinking about ceremony and we're the, you know, we are the blind man and ceremony is the elephant, then we are, we can look at it from all these different perspectives, okay? There's a lot of poetry inside it, you know, and lots of kind of allusions to kind of a uh, myth, okay? So it's, it's a myth about myth, all right? So that's important. So that's why... I, I don't I don't think that it's enough to just talk about it in terms of the monomyth and just say it's another example of the monomyth. And yet at the same time, it does follow that basic monomyth structure. Okay, so the story is about uh, Teo. Teo is um, uh, has just returned from World War II, where he fought in the Pacific Rim uh, against the Japanese. And Teo is um, half uh, uh, his mother was a uh, uh, an indigenous member of the Pueblo Tra Laguna of the Laguna Reservation, um, and she had uh, Teo out of wedlock with a we assume it to be like a white man. So, and then she runs off and dies, or she runs off, runs away from Manly, and sort of abandons Teo to grow up with his aunt and his cousin Rocky. So Teo and his cousin Rocky grow up as sort of like brothers, even though they're cousins, and he's raised by his aunt, but he's always kind of treated like a sort of a bastard child. Okay. Um, and then when the time comes for him to, uh, when World War II begins, Rocky wants to enlist in the military. And so Teo goes with him and they go to fight in World War II. Okay. So there's a lot of, you know, uh, the previous lecture we talked about Freud and the kind of um, post-traumatic stress disorder. Well, Teo, you know, is, uh, comes back and he's suffering from PTSD. So he goes through all these kind of issues where he loses his sense of self. Um, and he also, because his brother or his cousin Rocky dies, he has all these kind of nightmares about Rocky dying. And then also this kind of, uh, instance of killing someone, you know, um, in, in, um, uh, killing people in, uh, Japan, sorry, in the Pacific theater, you know, and a lot of the kind of Japanese people that he kills or he fights with look a lot like him. And it's very difficult for him to kind of understand that difference between the two. And one time when he's, uh, when he's, uh, when there's a firing squad and they kill some Japanese soldiers, he imagines that the Japanese soldier that he kills is actually his uncle uh, back home. So, sorry, he was raised by his aunt and also his uncle Josiah. And his uncle Josiah is very, very close to. But his uncle also passes away when he's gone. But he's convinced, even, and this is a sort of delusion, right, that he's going through because of his trauma, that the reason his uncle dies is because he killed him, okay? Or that he died in that Pacific theater. And then another thing that happens is when they're going through the kind of baton death march. So this might have been in the Philippines. I'm not sure. Okay, where his um, his cousin Rocky is injured and he's dying. They have to carry him through the mud, right? And it's and the mud is really bad because it's raining, right? And then Teo, at a certain point, he gets so you know he's so traumatized and they're going through this grueling death march where he's trying to carry his 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 cousin and the soldiers are threatened to kill his cousin if he can't keep walking. Uh, Teo curses the rain. He says the rain, you know, he like curses it and says, I wish it would stop raining. Right? And part of that sort of delusion that he goes through is when he returns to the reservation back in the American Southwest, which is very dry, he finds that there's a drought and the drought is, is causing general kind of really bad, you know, um, situations for everyone on the reservation. So a drought is kind of like, you know, if it goes on for a long time, then everyone's going to die. Okay, you can't grow, the livestock die off, things like that. And so this death that's going on in the reservation, Teo directly links, right, in his kind of, uh, in this kind of imaginative way to his cursing the rain, okay? Um, and he thinks that he's at fault for that, okay? So this is very, very similar to the Oedipus myth, right? In the Oedipus myth, you know, uh, there's a curse that has been placed on the city of Thebes, and the people there are suffering because of this curse. And, you know, little does the person, you know, but with an Oedipus case, he doesn't realize that the reason for the curse is him because he did this terrible thing of killing his father and marrying his mother. Okay. And so the curse needs to be lifted through this kind of journey, you know, of understanding. Okay. So for Teo, then he comes back to the, to the, Pueblo, to the Laguna reservation and there's been a curse that's placed on his people and everyone is dying. And the curse is not just kind of like, you know, f you know, material, like there's not enough rain. Okay. But it's also a sort of spiritual curse because the other people who have returned with Teo, you know, from the arm, you know, from the military battles are also really damaged. They're all alcoholics. You know, they, they couldn't, they, they're very, very violent. They're not kind of like helping out the reservation. Okay. So there's this kind of spiritual crisis that's going on that, in the story, at least, is linked to this idea of the rain, 
you know, and this kind of problem and the death that's going on and also the death of Rocky. Okay. So then the ceremony then is this kind of like this journey for Teo to discover why it is that the rain has gone and to bring back the rain. Okay. So it takes on this illusion is one of spiritual kind of uh, recovery, but also it's linked to kind of the recovery of your cultural loss given genocide, given this destruction and colonialism. Okay, so it's also linked to environmental factors. So it's very much before its time. Right now, we get a lot of stories about environment, but this was written in the 70s, you know, and it was talks about like nuclear proliferation, things like that, and how kind of uh, reservations were used for nuclear testing. Okay, and it's linked to Japan, right, and the nuclear, the nuclear, um, the nuclear bombing, the atomic bombing in Japan. Okay, so what's important about reading this as you're reading is it's very hard to get through. And understand all these shifts in temporality and the intertextuality, but ask you to be, be patient. And you can think about the overall picture while you're going on, the overall structure of this story of this young man who needs to recover from his trauma and work through it, right, in that kind of Freudian way. But then by going through this kind of process of finding what happened to the rain, and also not just what happened to the rain, but in a sort of quite literal way, what happened to his uncle Josiah's cattle, which were stolen. You know, so recovering the recovering the stolen cattle, uh, finding out what happened to the rain. This kind of journey is one that will kind of recover the spirituality of this reservation and of for Teo himself to recover from his own trauma. Okay, so that's the kind of basic story and how he goes through that. Okay, so you can read it through the mono myth, you know, but you can also read it through you know uh, these kind of different forms of narration, and you can also read it as a sort of story of indigeneity as well. Right. So this kind of idea that, you know, a post-traumatic stress disorder might be something that's not just about an individual, but about, about an entire cultural population and their kind of history. So we talked about that a little bit last week with um, uh, Juno Diaz's discussion of the Dominican Republic and how all of the young men of the Dominican Republic still suffer from a sort of national trauma of colonialism and then dictatorship. OK, so these links, you know, you can link on them, talk about these kind of youth groups that are launching a movement, right? Like at Standing Rock, for example, where one part of kind of being able to recover from the trauma of cultural genocide is to find a movement or, you know, something spiritual that will enable you to throw yourself into it as a sort of political stand against something like oil pipelines going through your land. OK. All right. Um, so this is some of that talk about working through in traumatic history. OK, and there's some talk about the way post-traumatic stress disorder and, you know, I, obviously I'm not a biologist. OK, so but the, there is some discussion about how even trauma such as like starvation and genocide can exist genetically and still get passed on through epigenetics. OK, so it's something, you know, it's interesting. OK, it could be pseudoscience. So, you know, read it with a grain of salt. OK. All right. So and here's some sorts of uh, some some sections from the mono myth that you can think about and how they apply to a story like like ceremony. OK, like a rite of passage or the wise old man, you know, in in um, in a in ceremony, the example would be like betoni. And I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. OK. All right. So, you know, and the relationship between myth and dream and the hero. So I want you to you can look through these on your own. OK. Um, and you can read it on your own. I like I said before, you know, the monomyth is a structural reading, and it doesn't have to ultimately be the kind of truth of it. Okay, it's just the kind of way to think about it. So what I want you to do is I want you to read, I want you to read all of all of ceremony by next week. Okay, and then I'll talk more about ceremony and do more close reading, and we're going to talk about it in relationship to uh, a different type of thinking. So not structuralism, but relationality. So for your readings, then, I want you to read these kind of discussions of what is considered to be, and I don't know how, uh, and obviously, you know, I'm, I'm not an expert on indigenous philosophy, okay? And it's, it's very difficult to find, you know, good, proper kind of citations for indigenous philosophy because very little of it was written down, okay? And obviously, they also went through a sort of cultural genocide. And also, not all indigenous people are the same, you know? So, you know, there's a lot of different things thinking processes. So we're just going to focus on one particular group set of readings of relational thinking, uh, kind of introduced by Ann Waters, based on American Indian thought. And we're going to talk about this concept of relationality. Okay, so that's what we'll be talking about next week in relation to ceremony. So you got a lot of reading to do. So please try to keep up with it. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, finish ceremony. And then what we'll do is, 
next week and I'm going to I'm going to send out a couple emails to gauge how is it that we're going to go about doing our presentations or doing the assessment for the course, okay? So, uh, don't forget that we still have um, you still have a final you still have a midterm essay you need to write on March 3rd. Okay? So that's actually coming up. You've only got about like 2 weeks or so to get that done. And what you can write about is you can write about you can write about ceremony, you can write about the Oedipus myth, you can write about um, Life of Pi, you can write about The Cheater's Guide to Love, uh, you can also write about what we're going to talk about in the future, you can write about Westworld, and you can also write about The Matrix. Okay, So these are all different stories that kind of engage with kind of this notion of myth, okay, and the kind of, uh, these kind of, well, uh, we'll talk more about that later, okay? But um, you do need to write that midterm paper, so start doing the readings, and if you have questions, ask them in the forum, okay? Um, and I'll post a new forum for today's lecture, okay? All right, so that's it for now. Um, we'll talk more in depth. And if you have certain passages or things that confuse you about ceremony, please please post it in the forum, and I'd be happy to answer your questions about it, okay? Um, that might be something that I also do. Instead, I assign everyone to kind of choose a passage from something, and then we'll kind of close analyze it together. Okay. All right. So yeah, I look forward to getting your comments, questions, and feedback in the forum and I'll talk to you there. Okay. Bye.